looked at it, no matter what commentary I read, no one had an adequate answer for what this verse was teaching. Denomination presidents, seminary professors, pastors, everyone in the pews. Jesus is telling us we're all snoozing. So why is the church sleeping? And what are the consequences? This parable is the emperor's new clothes of the New Testament. No one wants to deal with what it really says. But it was this passage and other passages just like it that led me to a jarring conclusion. If Jesus came back today, the church would not be ready. Now I realize this is a very scandalous statement. If we're not ready for Jesus, we have a problem on our hands. You see, Jesus taught that only the virgins who were ready would go in with him to the wedding banquet. Yet, in churches all over the world, almost no effort is going into preparing for the most important day in history, the day that Jesus comes back. So are we ready? Do we even know what ready means? I urge you to be skeptical. See for yourself what Jesus' own words have to say on the matter. It's a strange topic, but Jesus' words sounded strange to the listeners of his day as well. Are we really all that different? There's more to say than I ever imagined. After all, what could be more important than being ready for Jesus? Let's find out together what it's going to take for the church to shake off its 2,000-year-old nap. Turn in your Bibles this morning, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be reading verse 1 through 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And if you can, we'll you stand in honor of God for today. This is a parable given by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Beginning with verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bride and groom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and for you. But go, rather, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, to lift up worship unto you. Lord, to hear your word, and Lord, to let that word speak to us. Lord, I pray that we will not just be hearers of the word, but Lord, that we will be doers of the word. I pray, Lord, that there'll not be any self-deceived in the house, thinking that hearing the word is sufficient. Lord, your word always demands change. It determines, it requires sacrifice. And so, Lord, I pray that today that the word of God will sink down into the very fabric of who we are. Lord, today would be a day of exhortation to believers. Today would be a wake-up call to those who have always thought they were believers because they were in the house, they were in the church, they were in a religious family. Lord, today it would be a wake-up call to say, I'm not ready. 
I'm not ready for Jesus to come back. And Lord, to be honest, we have all, in some ways, been asleep. Lord, we have slumbered and we have slept. But Lord, we hear the alarm clock going off, and we ought to be alarmed at what is going on around us. We should also be alarmed by what the Spirit of the Lord is witnessing in our hearts. The day of your return is at hand. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But Lord, the most important thing is that we be ready. But Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Give us a heart to obey it, to do it, to put it into practice. Give me the ability to share your word in a way that would be profitable to your people. Lord, to accurately share what your word is trying to say. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just move across this congregation. And, to, and Lord, among those who are listening in right now, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will begin to bear witness to the truth in their heart. Lord, that it, they are hearing today. And Lord, I pray that you will receive the glory as you draw them to yourself. Women, boys, and girls, teenagers. Lord, I pray that that day will not catch us unaware. But Lord, that we will be ready with eyes lifted up, arms outstretched, saying, come forth, come forth. We are ready. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is, Are You Awake and Ready? Are You Awake and Ready? Now, I've heard people say before, you know, in the church, that it's hard to stay awake sometimes. I've known people who come to church, and I guess it's the best nap they've ever had. Bless their heart. I knew one lady years ago, and, and uh, she was a part of our church, and you know, when her husband died, she was at home at night by herself, so she was afraid to, to go to bed at night. She was afraid of, of the dark and the night, so she would stay up all night, and then she would come to church on Sunday morning, and she would sleep through the whole service. And then when it was all over, she'd go, oh, wasn't that a wonderful service? And we just loved her because we knew what she was going through. She was going through a tough time. But when it comes to spiritual things, sleeping can be very dangerous. Slumbering can be very dangerous. It can bring a lot of consequences to our life. I enjoy going to sleep at night. I wish I got more, but I'm thankful for what I do get because we do need rest. But when it comes to spiritual things, we've got to realize that living for Jesus is 24-7. It's 365 days a year until Jesus comes back or we go to be with him in heaven. And so we're always to be alert. We're always to be watching because we don't know the last day we'll breathe our last breath. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We do have the signs around us, if we are awake and watching, then we can be ready. Some of you heard a dream that I shared last year. I had it back on February 21st of 2018, and I'm just going to read it as it was written in my journal. It says, in this dream, we were in church. The entrance was like the old church location with a big open area before coming into the sanctuary. There were new people there, mostly young adults, standing at the back of the sanctuary in a small group. They looked familiar. After introducing myself, I realized some of them had once attended Grace Fellowship as kids. No one seemed aware of them and the significance of their attendance. I found myself concerned that they received the, that they received the attention they needed to feel welcome. I tried to find someone to give them a visitor packet and a card to fill out, but to find I uh, couldn't find anyone on duty. Then I remember preaching and I was becoming drowsy. I looked at my notes and they were be beginning to fade at point 17 and beyond. <laughs> Anybody that's been here very long probably says, I was in that service. <laughs> and it was like a computer screen that was bogged down and loading the screen. I then looked up and noticed that the room was dim. 
I saw there were several beds along both sides, side walls in the sanctuary with the headboards against the walls and the footboard toward the aisle. Everyone was covered up and sound asleep. I noticed that Sheila and I were in a bed at the front with the footboard toward the back of the building. I was sitting up in the bed with my back against the headboard. Sheila was asleep next to me. When I realized that everyone was asleep, I knew it was no use to keep going. I raised my voice and said, hey, everyone, let's stand. No one moved. I said, hey, everyone, it's time to get up. Still, no one moved. They were sound asleep. Then I raised my voice loudly and said, hey, it's time to wake up. Still, no one moved. Finally, there were about six sleepy people who gathered at the front as we stood by my bed. I looked out and thought, everyone needs to be up. And then the dream ended. Needless to say, when I woke up from that dream, God had my attention. And I hope that hearing that dream, God has your attention. Because sometimes we can be in the church and look like everything is fine when spiritually we're asleep. And when you're asleep, you're it's almost like being unconscious to the, to the world around you. Your, your senses are not on alert. Sounds, sometimes one sound that's real loud might awaken you, but there can be other sounds that go on through the night. Things that visually uh, you don't see. Things that you don't smell. You don't feel. All these senses begin to go into neutral. And it's as if you're not even alive. Although you are, you're just asleep. And we can be in the church and have all the workings of God happening around us and not be aware of any of it. It's amazing how we can be in the presence of God and some go away thinking, wow, that was an awesome service. God was moving. I received so much from the worship, from the message, and others go, what day was that? When did that happen? Because that's never happened with me. Could it be that you're asleep? No, Pastor, I'm in the church. I'm hearing everything. But are your spiritual ears tuned in? Jesus said, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We have natural ears. We can hear the words and we can hear the music. And yet inside, we're asleep. Well, the background of this parable here is a Jewish wedding. But we don't do weddings like the Jewish weddings, and so some of this may sound a little bit different. Why the ten virgins, and why are they waiting, and, and all the rest? Well, that's because in Jewish weddings, especially back in the Bible days, uh, they didn't just get in, uh, you know, engaged like we do today and then have a wedding. And they had some steps they went through. They usually sometimes had an arrangement by the parents. Now, teenagers... I know that you wish your parents would arrange a marriage for you with someone you've never met. You know, they do that over in, the, in other countries. And uh, statistically, those marriages last their entire life. And I asked some of them that have done that, and it's because they don't get married on the basis of love because they never, they never knew each other. They have a chance to know each other before they get married, but... The reality is they got married on the basis of covenant. Feelings was not the basis upon the, which the marriage was based. But today we have to feel like we want to be with this person the rest of our life. And so we get married based upon feelings and emotions and then we have a little struggle in our marriage and, and then we don't feel it. And then we think, well, I don't want to be married anymore because we just don't love each other anymore. Well, for those who are have come from arranged marriages, it was never about feelings to begin with. It was about a commitment. It was about family. It was about heritage. It was about legacy. It was about, it was about things much more important than feelings. But you know, if you stick it out, 
the feelings will come. The feelings will, can come back. Start doing the things you did when you first got married. It will be amazing if you start showing the same kindness and attention and doing the things you used to do. Amen? Well, today, we don't do it that way. And so, could you imagine if you just based your marriage on feelings, and let's say I woke up tomorrow morning and I, I just thought, Sheila, I just don't feel married today. I wonder what that day would be like. It would not be a good day because feelings have nothing to do with it. You are married. And she might punch me just to make sure that I feel the pain. <laughs> so sometimes there's an arrangement and then there's a betrothal. A betrothal is not like our engagement today. It's really more legal than uh, an engagement. An engagement is someone proposes and uh, Hopefully the guy. I know some girls do it today. Proposed to the man. But usually it was the man proposing to the woman. And, and at that point, when they said, yes, I will marry you, they have an engagement ring. And then they start preparing for the wedding. But there's nothing legal about it other than they, it's, a, it's a, just a verbal commitment, a heartfelt commitment. But betrothal was actually a written covenant. They would come together and they would have a covenant that would be written out. It would be the husband's agreement on how to take care that he would take care of his wife. She had nothing to do with wording anything in the covenant. I mean, she was just going to accept it from him. And so that betrothal actually was a marriage contract. To get out of that, once it was agreed upon, you would have to go through a divorce. Remember Joseph and Mary? Joseph was betrothed to Mary, and then she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, knowing that they had not yet consummated the wedding, this was an embarrassing situation, and it was not a good situation. And so he was uh, ready to divorce her, to put her away legally, because it would require a divorce to do that, because it was a legal contract. Well, after the contract, the groom would go away, and he would go back to his father's house, and he would begin to prepare a place for his bride. Now, let's, I think that would be good today that some people put off marriage a little longer so the guy can get his business in order. Amen? And be able to take care of that girl. So many just want to, hey, I love you, I love you, and let's go get married. They have nothing. They have no place to live. They have no money and no job. And uh, that, that is not a, a setup for a good lasting marriage. Well, he would go away to prepare a place, and those words are expressed in John, 5, uh, John chapter 14, when Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I go away to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. That's wedding language. Jesus was saying, You're my bride, the church, and I'm going away, and I'm preparing a place for you, and then I'm going to come back and get you, which was the next part of the, after the betrothal. The bride would set herself apart. Usually she would put on a veil, which would tell everyone I'm not available to anyone now. I am set apart for uh, my husband. And as a result, she began to get ready for that day. She began to prepare her life. And, and one of the things that she would do is she would keep a lamp. And that lamp would be burning. It was a symbol of her love. It was a symbol of her commitment. And oftentimes they would put it in the window seal or, or have it there to light up the house. It was an indication that her love was faithful all the way to the end until he came back. Well, obviously she did not know how long it was going to take. And so she needed to have oil on hand to keep the fire, to keep the flame going. Back in those days, the lamps were not like Lamps, maybe we, we've seen the, the little kerosene lamps. They were just a, a little piece of clay kind of bent up into a, a little container with a little spout on one end, and they would lay a wick down into the oil, and they would light the wick and adjust the wick accordingly so that it gave the best flame. And eventually that oil would, 
go down, and then they have to refill it with oil. But that was, that's kind of the background of this. And then one day, the bride, groom, would come back. And he would come back with the wedding party. He would come back with all of his groomsmen. And he would come back uh, ready to take his bride away. And, and at that point, it wasn't time to get ready. It was time to go. Bags packed, ready to go. House is ready. Daddy checked the house out, said, okay, get up the sun. It looks good. Go get your bride. And you know Jesus is waiting for his father even now. To say, son, go get your church. Go get your bride. Amen. Amen. I don't know when that's going to be. But I tell you what. If you're married to that bridegroom every day, you ought to be looking out the window wondering, is he coming back today? Is he coming back today? And so he would come and he would send usually his best man out and she, he would proclaim to give her a little notice. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. And her and her wedding party would go out and they would join that caravan back to the father's house where then there would be the consummation of the wedding and there would be a wedding feast usually seven days of eating and drinking and enjoying that celebration of marriage. This is the background of this parable. If we don't understand that background, it might not make as much sense. But we see here that there are some lessons in this parable that we need to Really take the heart. One is Jesus is coming back. Do you know Jesus is coming back? Yes. Jesus came the first time. He came to pay the price for sin. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. But next time He comes back, He's coming back to take His bride away and then to render judgment upon those who rejected Him. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Do you live with that daily anticipation and that daily readiness to embrace Him when He comes? Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that we should not be like those who shrink back. If Jesus were to come today, would you be going, Oh, oh Jesus, I'm not ready. I've got some things in my life that's not right. I'm, I'm doing some things that I know are wrong and I'm, I'm not, I haven't got my things in order. Well, there were some five foolish virgins in this story. They didn't have their life together when the bridegroom came. It was a very tragic situation. But Jesus is our bridegroom. We're married to Him. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, Paul talks about that how He had betrothed us to one bridegroom. You were betrothed. Once you came to Jesus, there was a contract that was made. He made a contract on the cross with His Heavenly Father. I paid for you. We didn't have to do anything other than to agree to the contract. To believe in Jesus. To trust Him. No works on our part involved. We simply accepted the price He paid and we accepted Him as our bridegroom. And then from that day forward, our life is not to be associated with the past. Our life is to be leaning forward, anticipating the future. Living as a married person on our way to a wedding feast in heaven. The book of Revelation talks about that wedding feast. I don't know if you've ever... Read it, Revelation 19. There's a wedding feast coming. Oh, it's going to be a glorious day. While we may want to wash Jesus' feet, the Bible says that Jesus will come and serve us. He will serve His bride. Jesus was a servant here. He continues to be a servant there. How much more should we reflect Him in our own hearts and lives today? I tell you what, if we could get away from the selfishness and the self-centeredness, the church would be a lot better off today. The kingdom of God would be so much better. But unfortunately today, the, the body of Christ is, is trying to buy for, for position and power and influence. And, and nobody wants to serve. Everybody wants to be at the, at the place of being served. But Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom will be the servant of all. Secondly, not everyone who is religious is ready. 
You know, there's a lot of people that come to church, not only here, but all across the nation and the world, down through the centuries. A lot of people look the part, but they're not the part. You know, you can look the part and not be the part at all. You can look religious and not be saved. And that's the tragedy that, was, that took place in the days of Jesus. There was a lot of religious people, Pharisees, Sadducees, and if you were to ask the people in town who are the most religious people, they would say, well, it's got to be the Pharisees. It's got to be the Sadducees. It's got to be the scribes. Those are the most religious people. If anybody's going to heaven, it's got to be them. But those were actually the enemies of Jesus. They were the ones that were not ready when he came the first time. Because, see, they were in love with the Scriptures, but they weren't in love with the one the Scriptures pointed to. You see, because when Moses gave them the law, Moses was like the friend of the bridegroom. He was preparing them for the coming of the bridegroom. And so he's walking, the, Moses is walking the bride through the steps to recognize it when he shows up. But then when Jesus shows up, the religious people were in love with the bride, I mean, with the friend of the bridegroom instead of the groom. They loved Moses, but they didn't love Jesus. Jesus said, you read the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. He said, but you don't come to me that I may give you life. Because I'm the one the scriptures speak of. You see, and that's the danger of being religious. It's all external. It's going through the motions. It's doing the checklist. I did my good deed. I went to church. I sang the song. I put in my offering. I, I did all the things that good people should do because good people go to heaven. And unfortunately, so many people that are good people are going to be in hell today. They are in hell today. And there will be more in hell. Because there's this a misconception that being good is all it takes. And how do we define being good? Because we all know we have sin. And so if we say we're good, it's because we compare ourselves to someone who's worse than we are. And in that, there's a judgment. In that, we begin to consider ourselves better than others. But we are all sinners according to the Word of God before we come to Christ. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In this passage, these five foolish were not saved. They were not saved. They were in the church. They looked like everybody else, but they were not saved. How do I know that? Because, verse 12, when they came knocking on the door wanting the Lord to open up to them, He answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. What a tragedy to get to heaven thinking you're going to be let in and then hear the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ say to you, you're not coming in. I do not know you. That's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a wake-up call for people who are expecting to go in to the wedding. Matthew chapter 7 is probably one of the most sobering verses. Verse 21 through verse 23, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, they professed faith in Christ, but they did not possess faith. They had a verbal expression of faith, but they did not have a saving faith that would transform their life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. Jesus called it being born again. Being born again. And so, if you're born again, truly born again, 
And if you're not just playing the part, there's going to be a change in your life. You're not going to be the same. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But it does mean this, that you're, you're in love with Jesus. And if you're in love with Jesus, you're not going to want to disappoint Him. You're not going to want to run around on Him. Amen? Could you imagine a woman that's been betrothed and then after the husband leaves, she goes, well, I've just got a few more months before to, to fool around and go around all my other boyfriends before he finally comes and takes me away. No? Not going to be that way. The Bible says that Jesus, Ephesians 5, is coming back for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He's coming back for a bride that's looking for him. He's coming back for a bride that's in love with him. He's coming back for a bride that's prepared. Are you prepared? Are you awake? Are you ready? Secondly, or the third one, Christ's delay reveals the difference between the religious and the saved. Now, why did the bridegroom delay? It doesn't say here why he delayed, but it just said he, he was delayed. He didn't come back within the time frame that she expected. And it wasn't like they could text. It wasn't like they could just call upon their cell phones. I'm running a little late. I mean, they were separated by probably miles along the trip. And so the delay was happening. And you can understand that during this delay, they began to get sleepy. Everybody would be sleepy. We need a little bit of sleep from time to time. And in that context, that was the... That was the expression. They began to slumber. It was the, the real believers and those who were not. They began to get sleepy. They began to not live serious. You know, it's been a long time since Jesus left the earth. And 2 Peter chapter 3 says, In the last days there's going to be scoffers coming, and they're going to say, Where is the day of his coming? For since he left... Every day goes on just like before. It says, but they do not realize that God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Why did God wait patiently before the flood came? Because he was waiting for people to get their heart right and get in the ark. And it says, and in the same way, they don't realize there is a, there is a judgment coming. And it is the long suffering of God that desires not to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so he waits. He tarries because when he comes, it's too late for so many. Also, Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21 tells us another reason he delays, and that is because of the fulfillment of those things spoken by the prophets. There is a particular time that will fulfill prophecy. So we have these two things. We have the, the opportunity for the lost to be saved. We have the opportunity for us to be working to get them saved because there is a final person that will be saved before Christ comes. And the Bible says in that same passage in 2 Peter chapter 3 that we can hasten the day of the Lord. And we can hasten it by being obedient. Do what He says. And get it done. Get the work done. So he can return. How many of you are ready for Jesus to come back? Not everybody raising their hand. <laughs> but I'm ready. I mean, let's face it. This world is not my home. This world is in trouble. Uh, I really don't want to see what this world's going to be like for my kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. Only Jesus can fix this mess. Because while everybody's dancing around gun control and drug control, immigration, they're all dancing around the real issue, and that is the human heart. Yes. Nobody wants to talk about the human heart, where it all comes from, because then we have to have someone to fix the heart, and only God can fix the heart. Amen. And nobody wants to talk about the real solution. But it's time for us as the church to begin to talk about the real solution. And the gospel is the cure for the sinful human sick heart. But during this delay, it revealed the difference. Why? Because the wise had brought along oil. The foolish had not brought along oil. You see, the wise, they're not, I mean, the, the foolish are not saved. They're religious. 
The lamps represent their light. It represents their good works. And you know when people first get excited about going to church and, you know, being a part of a church, a lot of times people go, well, hey, this is a, a different kind of life. And they get excited about it and they carry around doing good works like everybody else. You wouldn't really know much difference in the way they, they act. They're cooking food for people who are sick like everybody else. They're going to church like everybody else. They're, they're doing all the religious things checklist like everybody else. So they've got their lamp, but they don't have the Holy Spirit inside. They don't have that ability to wait all the way to the end. And so they're in it for the short term, for the happiness, for the thrills. But well, how many of you know that with any relationship with Jesus and the church, usually there's a honeymoon period. You love everybody, you get along with everybody, and then you get to know everybody. And when you get to know everybody and the little things about each other, just like in a marriage, I mean, you get, you get starstruck, you know, you get lovesick when you get married. But then after you, a while, you realize, hey, some of these little habits aren't changing. Some of these things are going to be permanent. I'm going to be living with these, this person the rest of my life like this. And so at that point, love has to go beyond and uh, just, you know, feelings. It has to go to commitment and and so these people, eventually, they begin to wear out. And they don't go to church anymore. They don't live for God anymore. They go back to drinking. They go back to doing drugs. They go back to sleeping around. They start doing the things they used to do. Why? Because it wasn't real to begin with. Amen. You say, well, could you backslide? I think everybody could say in some way that we backslidden away from our first love. Revelation chapter 2 talks about that. You've left your first love. I think there's times even in a marriage where you maybe things aren't quite burning so brightly in the, in the love category. But you know this, if you stay married, if you stay with it long term, the feelings will come back. Things get better. And, and I want to tell you that if you're really saved, if you, if you kind of get away from the Lord a little bit, He's not going to leave you alone. The most miserable person in the world is a backslidden Christian. The world can sin and enjoy it. But a Christian sins and he's miserable. He may try to deny it. He might try to suppress it. He'll stay away from church to escape it. He'll try to stay away from preaching and worship and everything else to try to somehow put the earplugs in his spiritual ears. But the Lord keeps saying, you know that's not right. And you'll come back. If you can stay away from the Lord and you never feel that, you need to get saved. Amen. You need to get true enough born again. Amen? All right. So it reveals the difference. One's waiting all the way to the end. The other's just in it for the moment. Next, you cannot borrow someone else's faith. They tried to, the foolish tried to borrow oil from the wise who had the oil. But the wise were waiting for his coming. They couldn't afford to give their oil and not be prepared with their lamps burning when he came back because that was a symbol of their long-term commitment. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. I'm committed all the way to the end. The others had just enough oil to get them through a little short temporary wait. If it doesn't happen, then I'm out of here. So they couldn't borrow. They couldn't borrow from somebody else's salvation. And friend, you can't borrow from somebody else's salvation. You can't borrow from your mama's salvation or your daddy's salvation or your preacher's salvation or your husband's salvation or your wife's salvation. Kids, you cannot borrow salvation from your parents. Your parents bring you to church, but that's not good enough. Are you born again? Do you know Jesus? Have you accepted the marriage contract, the betrothal? Do you know him? Or are you just doing the checklist and then going back to all the other things that you do in our culture today? I believe God's calling out our youth. 
He's calling them up and out of this world. I mean, that's how they ought to be living. You have nothing to gain by living like the world. You have an inheritance in heaven. You have a, a, a Jesus who loves you and has a plan for your life. Don't sell short by trying to do it the world's way. Next, Christ's return will reveal that difference. Look, look over here in Revelation between the wise and the foolish. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, 24 through 25. Remember here in this passage, it talks about the wise and the foolish. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. Everybody say wise man. Wise. Who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. What was the difference between the wise and the foolish? In this passage, the wise heard it and did it. The foolish heard it and didn't do it. You see, one of the greatest deceptions is self-deception. James chapter 1 talks about that. He, to be here, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceive in yourself. You see, because one who hears the word, you come into church and you hear a preacher on television or whatever, and, and you hear it and you and you say, Amen. And because you say amen to it, you think, All right, I got it. But then you go out and live like you don't have it. Someone can talk to you all about saving money, but if, and you can say, yeah, that's a good idea, but if you never save money, it didn't help you at all. It didn't make any difference in your life. And so that is the difference between the wise and the foolish. The, the wise heard the Word of God, and they did it. The foolish heard the Word of God and didn't do it. And what was the word that the wise heard and did? Matthew Chapter 25, verse 13, it says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You see, the command was watch. There are some people who hear watch and say, Amen, Jesus is coming back. But they don't watch. They're asleep and enjoying it. They're not ready. And they really don't care until the seriousness of that day comes and then the seriousness of his command will come way down. In this passage in Matthew chapter 7, both built a house. From the outside it looked good. But what revealed the difference? The storm. Folks, there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. Storm of judgment. There's a storm coming to our world. There's a storm coming. It could come to America as a country. Who's going to stand in that day? Everybody looks good on the outside, but the question is, are you built on the rock? Is your life built on Jesus? Or is it built on church? Is it built on your family? Is it built on your job? Is it built on America? United States? Is it built on anything besides Jesus? Because when the storm comes and when the foundations are shaken, that which is built upon sand will fall. And that which is built upon the rock will stand. The day will reveal it. But now's the time to make sure. And finally, the door of opportunity will one day be closed. Right now, the door is open. Indeed, in this passage, we see that the five that were ready, the five wise virgins, when he came, they went with him, and they went into the wedding feast, and the door was shut. They were ready. They had taken the opportunity given them. The foolish, on the other hand, were scrambling around to get ready, scrambling around to get a true relationship with God, but it was too late. And when they came and knocked on the door, said, Lord, you know, Lord, we, we're the ones that were in church. We were in church with those other five. Jesus would say to them, 
Depart from me, for I never knew you. They never were saved. They were religious, but they weren't born again. In response to the word today, I want to ask you a question. Are you religious or are you real? Can you answer that question honestly? Because it will make all the difference in the world when that day comes. Are you religious or are you real? Are you watching or are you just talking about watching? Are you awake and ready when he comes? I'm going to ask our place team to come up. Ask them to lead us in a song. And I'm going to be down here at the, at the front. And I want us to stand, if you will. Bow your heads. How many of you would say, Pastor Keith, I love Jesus, and I am awake, and I am ready. I'm awake, and I am ready. If Jesus came back today, my heart would rejoice. I'm not holding back. I'm, I'm ready. How many of you could say, that's where you are today. Just lift your hand. Nobody looking around. Amen. Put your hands down. How many of you would say, Pastor Keith, I'm, I think I know Jesus and I, I've made a commitment to him in the past, but I've kind of gone to sleep. I've been, I haven't been watching like I should. I'm not ready. But I know today the Holy Spirit is dealing with my heart and, and I've got some things I need to get done. I need to get some things changed in my life. I need to get, I need to wake up and I need to get up and I need to stand up again. I need to get serious about my walk with Jesus again. And would you pray for me? How many of you would say, that's me? Would you lift your hand? Thank you for being honest. Thank you. You put your hands down. How many of you would say today, Pastor Keith, if Jesus were to come today, I know I would probably be one of those that he would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. I don't know Jesus. I've never, I've, I've heard about him. I've been in church. I've done all the religious things, but I don't know Jesus. And I, I'm tired of playing the game like I do. I want to be saved. I want to be saved so that I know I'm saved. Anybody here that would raise your hand and say, that's me. Would you pray for me today? Anybody? All right. I want us to. Uh, I want us to go ahead and lift our hands all together. I want us to pray this prayer out loud together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I want to be ready when you come back. Forgive me when I've been lazy in my walk with you. Today, I want to be awake. I want to be aware. I want to be ready. And I want to help others be ready. You're coming back. You're coming back. And I pray today. And I pray today that you would help me. That you would help me to help others. To help others get ready. Get ready. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is helping me get ready. Who is helping me get ready? Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. That is a mirror on my heart. That is a mirror on my heart. It shows me what's inside. That shows me what is inside. Help me to read your word. Help me to read your word. And let it speak to me. And let it speak to me. And show me what I need to change. And show me what I need to change. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's conviction. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's conviction. Well, tell me when I'm doing wrong. To tell me what I'm, when I'm so doing I wrong. So I can get it right. So I can do it, get it right. From this day forward. From this day forward. I want to be watching. I want to be watching. And I want to be ready. And I want to be ready. 
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a short invitation here. If you need prayer, you need to come to the altar, feel free to do that. If you need Jesus, you didn't raise your hand, but you need Jesus, would you come? Would you come? The most important thing you'll ever do is receive the gift of salvation. It's offered today. Would you come?
have that uh, just a second, please. It's good. It's good to have Greg and Angela. 